I feel like I need to say something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's probably better than sitting in silence. Um, <laughs> one thing I'd say to everyone watching, there's um, the ability to ask questions um, throughout the webinar, and um, you can just type them in there. So you can type them in at any point. Um, we will come back to them uh, at the discussion segment afterwards. Um, so each of the presenters will do about a five to ten uh, minute presentation. Um, we'll, we'll go through them and, and then um, the, the rest of the time will all be discussion. So hopefully we'll, we'll try and get through as many questions as possible. Um, but ones that we don't manage to answer, we'll, we'll try and do a sort of um, a, a roundup of them and um, send it out as an email afterwards. So, so please do put the questions in, even if uh, we're sort of running out of time, because we'll, we'll try and um, try and get to them afterwards and, um, and, and have it as a sort of piece of article content so that, that we're, we, um, we definitely cover everything. Okay, I think that's probably right. Okay, I think um, we'll make a start there. Welcome everyone to the second of our, our webinar series on the digital twin. This one is entitled The Many Uses of the Digital Twin, and um, we're looking forward to really getting into some interesting use cases that you can do with this technology and, and, and maybe even actually really get at the concept of what a digital twin is. Um, so we've got some really great speakers. Um, Melissa Zanoko, OBE. Um, I, I was hoping that she'd put the OBE in the background just to give us more credibility. <laughs> um, uh, we'll, we'll be speaking about um, some of the structural analysis and, and, and what a, a true digital twin is. And then Simon Sadek, who runs 360virtualtour.co, um, will talk us through some of the digital twins that he's made and that they're on a really brilliant variety of projects. And then uh, Bill Gregory will be speaking from Kentucky. And thank you for joining us at 7 a.m. <laughs> Hello. Uh, on, on some of the exciting projects he's done, and uh, I would say saliently on zombies, uh, which I'm very excited about. Um, but those are just my sort of um, uh, short introductions. Um, I, I'd like maybe the speakers to just briefly say um, uh, some of their experience and and, uh, and introduce themselves, and then and then we'll move on to the presentation. So, Melissa, if you could introduce yourself first. Right, yes, thank you. Um, so I'm Head of Programmes for the Infrastructure Client Group um, and that brings together, um, it's UK based and it brings together the leading economic infrastructure clients in the UK. So um, that covers transport, water, energy, um, nuclear and um, broadband. Um, so kind of got the whole system in the room. Um, and uh, as part of the programme, there's a digital transformation task group. Um, and that has the chief data officers or equivalents from across all of those organisations that meet together. Um, we kind of call it a homework sharing club, where we create spaces where they can share their mistakes and share their best practice. Um, I'm also um, co-chair of the Digital Twin Hub Community Council um, and also uh, on the Global Advisory Committee for the World Economic Forum Digital Twin Cities Project. Wow, that's a fantastic range of experience, Melissa. Thanks for joining us. Um, and now, Simon. Hi, uh, my name is Simon, Simon Sadek. So I'm a director of 360virtualtour.co and uh, I also run a number of other agencies, photography agencies as well. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, it's the first time I, I'm, I'm doing this with you guys. So it's uh, great to be here and to be with, uh, with the lovely speakers that we have coming on, uh, with us as well. Um, so I run uh, the, uh, 360. So we do a lot of 360 photography, scanning, and uh, modeling for clients. My clients range anything from government right through to retail, to uh, hotel chains, to museums and heritage as well. Heritage is a particular area that I'm uh, really kind of, kind of become a passion really in the last uh, six months or so, which is great and fascinating as well, to be honest, for those that are 
uh, that are not aware of, um, of that space. Um, and tourist boards as well. So it's all about um, uh, creating 3D models, stuff on Google Street View as well. So I do quite a lot on, on that program uh, uh, as well. So to update Street View for clients um, and also for those clients that want things a little bit more private, off the grid a little bit, um, which we know there's, 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 a, there's a scope for that as well. So yeah, excited to be on the panel, talking everything about digital twins. I, I from my experience, I use different things to different people, different sectors. So yeah, looking forward to the talks. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Simon. Uh, and I think the heritage thing's really interesting. It, it's amazing how you can open up these brilliant spaces to so many more people through the digital twin. Um, and yeah. finally, Bill um, from Kentucky, um, if, if you could say a few words about um, the, the fantastic stuff that you're getting up to. Uh, sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Bill Gregory. I am the uh, CEO of R RSET, uh, the Rapid Synthetic Environment Tool and uh, also founder of it. Uh, we've been doing this for a long time. My team and I, a bunch of like-minded nerds, decided to do a lot of scanning work sometime back. Uh, we've been, um, we've done scanning in caves and underwater dives, we've, and uh, we've done archeology, span and we started working for the military a while, uh, about 10 years ago, and I can get into more of that, we have more time, but, uh, and, decided that there were a lot of tools to make digital twins for people to uh, really have the time to enjoy them in their own way and not be locked in a certain system. So I'm happy to go over this uh, with everyone. Fantastic. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the presentations now um, and I'm just gonna change the screen so that Melissa is presenting and then um, we, can, we can hear all of her fantastic insights from all those um, varied uh, organizations that. Uh, Melissa works for. Thanks, okay, Melissa. so the first thing is, can you see the screen is the first thing? Yes, the many uses of digital twins. <laughs> Perfect, good, good start, it's all going well. Okay, <laughs> so um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to take us right out to the really big picture um, to talk about use. So I'm really going to focus on the part of the use of the digital twin um, because during COVID, um, the built environment got together um, to produce our vision for the built environment. Um, and this is the vision here. It's um, a vision where um, the uh, explicit purpose of the built environment is to enable people and nature to flourish together for generations. Um, and so when, when we're talking about the use case, for us, the use of the digital twin is, is to get those outcomes for people and nature so that they can thrive together for generations. Um, and then um, the way that we do that, how do we get those outcomes, is that we need to acknowledge that the built and natural environments are kind of complex and interconnected systems, which I'm going to explain a bit more. Um, and so, uh, again, our use case for a digital twin should be how do we intervene better on that system, uh, that's sort of the bigger picture. Uh, and then um, the understanding that um, if you put that together with the better outcomes and the systems, the bit that sits in the middle is the services. Um, so what I, uh, I think my other uh, amazing panelists are going to talk about, in a sense, is are those services, it's the services for people and for nature. Um, and that's the thing that connects the two. So I'm just going to very briefly just dive down into those uh, areas. So um, the outcome is um, at the centre of the built environment. So at the moment we do things like we build buildings or we have assets and that we do it in a siloed uh, way. Um, but actually the reason you're doing that is to actually um, improve um, outcomes for people and nature. And as you can see on this diagram here, it's showing that the use of that um, asset um, can go on for years and it can actually go on for hundreds or even thousands of years uh, but it's going to be over a long period um, and that period is longer than the period that it takes to build them so again if we're like a use case obviously it's great to use digital twins for um, construction and design and all the things you can see there um, but it's a real waste of the digital twin if it's not actually for the operation and maintenance as well um, and that's where you can get the biggest benefits um, and then on the right, what you can see there is that the outcomes, really, we should be able to see an alignment through to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So the idea is that that person that's hammering the nail at the bottom, that's kind of at the project or programme level, that they should see how they're helping to achieve community outcomes, how they're helping to achieve national outcomes, like, for example, Net Zero by 2050, and how that's hoping, helping to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and so, again, with your digital turn, the use case for it, 
you, you know how, how far can you align through that and that that's that's what we should be really aiming for um, so then just explaining what we mean by the system of systems so you've got the um, social infrastructure which is like houses hospitals um, schools then you've got economic infrastructure which is all the stuff in between it so it's the transport the water the energy etc and they're all inextricably linked but at the moment we all kind of manage them individually but they're actually all inextricably linked and then in nature everything's inextricably linked and there's things like ecosystem services and the built environment sits in the natural environment and they're inextricably linked and now we're starting to have cyber physical infrastructure which I think you're going to hear about coming up and they're all inextricably linked so that together becomes the system of systems and as I said before it's the services in the middle you don't need a, a building you need shelter you don't need a bridge you need to get from A to B so that's really the use of a digital twin we should be really aiming at that um, and the enablers you'll see here amongst other things so it's really important to remember that digital twins are just enablers and there's lots of other factors but you'll see <laughs> digital twins on there so just as a reminder of what we mean by a digital twin it is that um, you've got the uh, physical asset and they've been used a lot in uh, formula one which is why this is here so they were kind of the first and there's data that comes from the physical asset and and that goes into the digital model that you've got of it um, but the reason it becomes a digital twin is if you then have it going back the other way with the interventions so that data allows you to have insights those insights inform your decisions and then you therefore intercede better on the physical um, asset and that gives you your better outcomes so it's that the loop that makes it a digital twin as opposed to just a, a sort of a 3d model um, so if we take that for a carriage car on uh, so this is on a train now let, let's say we take that on a train and we've got our digital model of it there um, but then it's actually you know that train is running on a track and then there's also the signaling system and I think we all know the issues with signaling systems so um, it'd be actually really useful if all of those digital twins could talk to each other so you're starting to talk about connected digital twins um, and you can see that the use of the digital twin will then like expand and you'll have much bigger benefits if you can connect them um, but then if you start thinking about well a train's usually going somewhere and let's say it's going to the airport um, and so really it would be great if we could start to connect across sectors the digital twins and so now we're starting to talk about a national digital twin um, and so again if you go back to that system of systems the biggest benefit for the use cases of, uh, of digital twins will be at that systemic level um, and uh, and again the biggest benefit will be if it's for the use of the mm -hmm. asset and the system and so what you can see here is how connected digital twins would work so you'd have digital twins for all the individual things and then you'd have like a federation of digital twins which would be a national digital twin and it would only be when they need to connect so it wouldn't be this one big twin all the time talking to each other this is when those need to connect to share data then there's an interoperable way for them to do that so i want to give you an example of that because you're probably thinking, oh, that sounds good it's a good idea or it sounds perfect you know theory but um, the climate resilience demonstrator known as credo um, has put that into practice so it's taken a, a global systemic challenge, which is climate change. And, and the only way we're going to resolve that is with systemic thinking and with uh, connected digital twins. And they enable that cross sector data sharing, which is what we need. Um, and uh, so Anglian Water, uh, BT and UK Power Networks all shared their data that would usually be private um, in order to understand how they could better respond to the impacts of flooding both preventative and, and after it's happened. Um, and um, I'm not going to talk about this, but this is showing, you know, if you want to have a look at it, this is kind of the, how the, the flow for how the digital twin would work. So, and I'm sure we can take the slides afterwards. Um, but the kind of things that they were able to demonstrate is that if an asset of um, UK power networks was knocked out by flooding, that would actually knock out Anglian Water and BT as well. Um, and so actually, that interconnection you know those two organizations need to be investing and communicating with uh, UK power networks and vice versa so when you start to see the world like this you can see that the, the use case for the digital twin sort of really amplifies and uh, because they couldn't make that public because it's um, obviously private data they've made a simulation of it with a with an invented city so you can actually go on to the digital twin hub and, and actually have a play with this yourself and see if this area floods you know how does that impact things 
Um, and they also made a film which shows um, what I've been talking about, that bigger picture, which is like, why do we care? Why does it matter? So again, you can find that uh, film on the Digital Twin Hub and it's now just moving into the next phase. So if you want to follow, uh, find out what's happening with that, you, you, can, you can find out what's going on um, because really this could be the first step on the National Digital Twin and we can just keep adding to it. And so, and I'll stop there, come back to you. Wonderful. I think there was an awful lot of uh, interesting points in there. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to getting into them, some of them in in, in the discussion. Um, but for now, um, we'll move on to Simon. Um, and I'll just make Simon the presenter. Thank, thank um, you. But thank you very much, Melissa. It was really interesting. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> I mean, I've made some notes, <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> on some questions. Um, well, it's to begin with. Um, I think from what Melissa was saying, um, I, for my role and, and what, what my what my um, what my company does is we create the digital twins uh, for clients. So if we can uh, looking at what Melissa was put on there regarding um, the simulations and, and all of these old things that happen in the back end, right? That, that that the average person wouldn't even probably even think of, right? Um, but this is what what keeps things going. And I suppose from a digital twin perspective, what it means my award and, and for my clients um i mean what let's touch on, on on i'm going to start off with heritage just because i love it uh, and it's something that's that's been um definitely a, a request from my clients it's on the tourism board i mean i'm going to say post covid if i can if we can if we can label that i've definitely had requests from clients wanting to as what can they do to increase tourism and one of the areas that, that a lot of clients are are, are thinking are, are looking at is there's a lot of countries out there, UNESCO protesting protected sites, a lot of heritage archaeological sites that not many, uh, that's not really always shouted about in tourism. You know, it's always all, all talking about all the, the, the fun stuff and all the things, that, uh, the, the hot sun, the beach and things like that. But there's a lot of other things that, uh, around heritage that, 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 that is available to tourists. And what we're now finding is as a result of doing these uh, 3D models, so this is using the Matterport system, uh, which a, a lot of clients are definitely starting to come on board with just because it's just it's easy to to use it's straight to the point it's visual um and to be honest it, it looks great um so i i do stuff quite a bit with the matterport platform but i also do a lot of stuff on google so i do a lot of google street view things um, and, and it's just pretty much um, the navigating or showing off a space in its truest form so so when when in my world when we say 3d modeling it's it's a it's a represent a digital representation of reality and, and that can also be labeled as a digital twin i mean this is for example a, a lovely site over in in, in a, a lovely sunny island i'm obviously sunny it's, it's beachy island of ibiza um, but ibiza actually has quite a number of unesco sites which when i mentioned this to people around digitizing sites the museum the archaeological sites and used as a means of uh, boosting local tourism. As a result of this project, which we put all together into one nice 360 portal that you can see here. So there's one, two, four, six, there's eight sites across the island which we put into one into one portal here. Um, and then the, um, the Ibiza government and uh, the heritage uh, teams, archaeological teams, they've been sharing this globally. So we can measure um, as a result of these digital twins in reality. Uh, we can then provide analytics reporting in terms of how many online views it's had and um, how long uh, um, views have been on a particular spot, for example, looking at it, zooming in. It's, 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 it's great, right? Um, so this is pretty much uh, one of the main uses from a heritage space uh, sector, but also from a tourism, because it does also touch onto that space as well. So this is one of the ways that one of my the, uh, that, that clients uh, are using it to increase tourism, to digitize but also keep a digital archive. And I think that's pretty much what Melissa was touching on as well, is to have a digital representation of reality. And it's on to other things as well, like BIM. Uh, for those that, that are familiar with BIM modeling, uh, so building, Matt, correct me, building information modeling, just to, just to clarify, yeah, yeah, is that it? I'm getting, I'm getting <laughs> there. Um, so that is then extracting further digital information from the digital twins that we create. Um, so just to touch on another sector, for example, it's, it's the government sector. So here, here in the UK, I'm doing a, a number of projects with the government here, and it's around digitising um, uh, tower blocks. So 
one of the great uses of tower blocks. Um, so this is a, a tower block council a council block, and uh, it can be called different things. And um, great point of, of uh, digitizing this is that a the council have a digital representation of the building, saves them having to travel back in their different teams, so electricians or um, uh, water teams, any type of maintenance or facilities management really. Um, they can use this. Um, uh, they, they can visit the, the the building virtually, which, when you think about it in the grand scheme of things, you know, you can. Uh, it's, it's also a net carbon saving because it, it, it reduces the, the element of, of traveling. When you know, what, why do they need to travel when they can see everything pretty much as if they're there? So um, this client has very made very good uses of these hotspots. Uh, let me just uh, expand everything here. And then you can see a difference. So you've got the fire doors, um, sprinkler system, blah, 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 blah. So these are, this is all information that at a facility management level, it's, 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 it's golden, really. Um, so, you know, this is the upper level there. You can see the electrical systems um, and boards. We're still um, uh, uh, constantly adding new asset tags. Asset tags being, you know, what is this? Um, so the client will give us a photo of what this would be inside. And then we'll... We'll, we'll, we'll put a little bubble there similar to what we have here and then that gives just further information to the viewer and again the viewer can be uh, different um, different services like electricians or uh, the water companies or, or the lifts or the structure element that type of thing so as a great uh, as a first visit this is a digital twin really is uh, in this case it speaks wonders um, and I think as well from what Melissa was uh, keep I'll keep, uh, yeah, coming back to you, Melissa, but it's because what the presentation that you used is just, it's just, it touches on so many things. From a fire safety perspective, uh, and this is probably a question I have for you later on, Melissa, um, the, this digital twin of this block, for example, not only is it used for the council and the government level, but also at the fire level, so the fire, um, the fire teams and crew. So if, God forbid, they need to attend a, a building, normally they would have access to some sort of floor plans, but how great would it be if they have access to the entire block uh, on route or, or uh, uh, you know, and they can visualize straight away the route. And then there's other things that we can touch onto that, such as wayfinding uh, into certain flats or areas of, of the building. So many different elements, and all of that comes into that whole digitization uh, purpose. Um, I'll just touch on to, to a few other points there, and then, um I'll, I'll pass on it this was another another uh, great building here over if you haven't been there recommend you visit um oh whoops and um, so this is a, a just an example of um uh, of, of, a, of a 3d model um just to view the, the restroom so this is a private members club um but it also has uh, they're very big with art and um, so one of the things what's that it's, uh, it's just it's taking a slight um second to, to load up um i think one thing to say is that um actually navigating around these models is very very smooth but because we're we're basically running it through go to webinar it's a little bit jumpier than than the actual user experience would be um sorry simon it, no no, no, no. yeah no thanks thanks for mentioning that so you know there's there's other uses as well especially now from a meta perspective so you know, they have clients that we're talking with that they want to now, if you're into the blockchain space and, and, and the crypto space, you know, NFTs is something that's now being discussed uh, with clients. And so when you're looking at a, a 3D model, you know, have access to that NFT representation that, that they can click view in, an, in, in a metaverse environment, purchase it, or, or you're navigating your own gallery and then you've got different NFTs or digital art represented around so many different news and, and to be honest, we're just at the, at the, at the, the start really um, of where true digitization and true digital twins uh, will take us um, so I, I'm, I'm super pumped with you know what, what's around the corner to be honest and um, we can share it Matt if you like afterwards and, and feel free to share that with the audience and um, on another one here from a, a flight training um, client as you can see we're in the lovely hangar here and what they've done and um, so just loading that a second and um, they we've digitized their, their flight training center and then what uh, this allows um prospective pilots or graduates or even because you know clients can can share these models with the schools and imagine showcasing this into a classroom full of um for the kids you know and they're like oh my god i'm walking into the flight training center you know it's just it's just sharing these experience these spaces with uh, and experiences for people that 
or maybe not able to access these sites. It's sort of an heritage side of things, you know. Um, so yeah, great way of of, um, of showcasing spaces, the, the, the virtual tours, digital twins, 3D modeling. Again, depending on who my sector is, they use different terms in, in slightly different ways. Factories or the AEC, architect, architectural engineering and construction industries, massive uses. Uh, and I'm sure Bill has got a few in his pocket that he'll come back, that he'll come and share with us. Um, this is massive space uh, regarding the digitization. I personally feel here in the UK, I think we still have a lot more to do regarding digitization. I think in the US, it's it's a lot more common than, it, than what it is here. But I think recent government mandates um, are kind of like um, pushing or driving customers uh, or companies to digitize more of their, their asset base. Um, itself. So again, it's it's something that, that, that I, again, talk to my clients, the AEC sector, they are starting to do, and they have been doing for, you know, the last 12 to 18 months, pretty, pretty much driving uh, more the digitization, uh, national highways, UKPN, UK Power Networks, and a few of the other groups as well. You know, they're all getting into the digitization uh, side, which is great. Um, and, and it has so many uses in the internal workflow, like Melissa was mentioning there. So uh, it's a very, very big sector, um, and there's a lot a lot happening in that space um, as well. So especially with Matterport, but also with the, the likes of um, the OGs like Leica and, and, and the BLK uh, equipment and stuff like that. So it's, it's, yeah. Last one I'm going to touch on sector wise is just um, before Matt gives me the nod uh, <laughs> uh, is regarding the retail sector um, uh, itself. So, with the retail sector, um, again, many uses. And the great thing about these, these digital twins is that we can actually push it onto Google Street View um, and then it becomes part of the Street View platform um, itself. So, um, uses of digital twins in the retail sector is A, to showcase the space, you can then link e commerce into the product range. Um, you know, post-COVID era, e online is just massively catapulted into, into, the, into, into huge numbers and people are using digital more uh, in their time, spaces, mobile even. Um, so why not shop, you know, in, in a space? So digitize the, the, the actual uh, showroom, put some hot, uh, hot spots in there of the, the products and, and, and you can purchase it straight away online. Um, in this, this client, which is Calvin Klein and, and the, the Tommy Hilfiger group, you know, in the process of uh, already digitized pretty much the entire asset um, showroom base here in the UK. And it's constantly refreshing with new concept stores and things like that. So they use this a lot more internally, more for their visual merchandising team. So then they keep their VM uh, practices consistent across all the stores. So what, what is done in London Regent Street, for example, by the VM team is replicated exactly by anyone else around the country as well. So, yeah, a lot of different uses there, um, and it's it's. Uh, I, I mean, I think with the time that we've got, it's, it's, it's going to be some interesting questions coming coming by. Um, Matt, I think I'm going to wrap up. I haven't, I didn't look at the time yeah, there, so apologies. I'm not going to no, that's great. I Thank you, Simon. Up, yeah, but yeah, just a little showcase of just some of the work that we do uh, with our with our awesome client base. No, you're obviously packing in a lot of content there, so thank you so much. And if you do need anyone to carry your tripod next time you're going out and scanning Ibiza, I am available. There's a couple <laughs> in Italy coming across in the board, so if, you know, if, if you're good with that, I I'll, I'll should, make a tip for that. I, I'm up for a business trip for sure. Um, <laughs> and, and actually, it was, it was interesting you mentioned um, fire safety and, 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 and mapping out that, that large tower block, because I think our next guest is definitely going to have something interesting to say on that. Um, from all of Bill's work with fire brigades and first responders and the military, I think um, there's, 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 there's definitely something interesting there. So um, Bill, I'll let you take over. Uh, thank you. Uh, just to follow back up in case somebody join uh, later, my name's Bill Gregory. I'm in uh, the US and Kentucky right now, a little bit earlier than a lot here are probably being here. Uh, but anyway, uh, we uh, started with the military about 10 years ago that we developed our set. At the time, the Marines were looking for the capability to do rapid modeling of interior spaces uh, the, in the buildings. So they would have to go back in and clear the building again sometimes, and they wanted a map to go back through. So we actually started developing our own hardware for doing the scanning. 
But then we started noticing a lot of scanners coming online at the time, and this is around 2014, 2015, somewhere in there. So we decided to pivot and say, let's make a tool that makes use of the digital scans that someone else might do and let them do more with it than just uh, 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 look at the model or be locked into an ecosystem. So our set was born. And again, our set is the rapid synthetic environment tool. And our goal was to build a tool that someone could use without any uh, 3D modeling or trainings. Uh, you didn't have to need a CAD artist or, or a 3D a blender artist or something to make a model. We wanted something that a soldier in the field without any training could pick up and present a scene back to command or something like that if they needed. Uh, if you could play Call of Duty is what we wanted you to have the skill level to play off, to do our set. So we built the tool. <clears throat> And also we found Matterport about that time and it became more or less our gold standard for doing interior scans. Uh, the Navy really liked our approach, so they we've been under contract with them since. Uh, now, after starting with the Navy, we moved into first responder markets, which are your firefighters, police, emergency medical providers. Uh, and then um, we built the tools that help modify the scans. So, any Matterport scan that any of you've created or something like that, you can pull into our set and develop your own training scenario around it now. Uh, it, it works great. Anybody can do it. Um, we've been then, like I said earlier, in archaeology, museums, theaters, schools, court cases. We've been used all of the above since then. Uh, so we threw together some examples here. I think our stuff's better told through uh, videos, uh, 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 but I hope it translates well into this webinar so we'll, we'll give it a try and I'm going to start and stop the video as we go uh, uh, happy to answer questions if anybody has panelists right now as we're going along so here is uh, the freedom to do more with your scan so this is our tool our set um, so capture improve use is our, our big thing so capture it in whatever method you can now, again Matterport is what we primarily use especially with the new Pro 3, it's moved that outdoors for us. Improve, we have our improvement engine, which is our scenario designer, and then use it. And it, we can be used with a game controller like this. You can be used with the VR system, it's native VR, or uh, just exploring it on your desktop or your Mac. Um, so we scan Matterport, as you see here, a Pro 3, and then you get the interior, uh, right, we're doing the interior in this one, so it's the building space, and you get the dollhouse view uh, in our set to start laying out your scene. But you can combine multiple scans into one. And here you can combine several buildings or rooms into one scan if you need them to create a contiguous layout. Uh, then you can add objects into your scene. So any object that you want, like download something from uh, TurboSquid or, or any sort of 3D service or design your own, you can add and lay the objects yourself in the space and move them around. Uh, so you can see how easily it's done. Uh, we'll get back to this theater stuff a couple of times in here, but we've scanned theaters and let them do virtual layouts uh, in the space. So we have these tools uh, here for coming in and placing whatever you want in the scene. Uh, then you can even add lighting to the scene if you want to. Um, uh, so here, add, them, add spots, add general lights, add flashing lights, however you want. Now we have the, all of our exploration tools once you have your scan in in our set. So this is an interesting use case. This is a, um, a home we scanned in various levels of construction. So we scanned it when it was at the studs and the piping and the electrical work was being done. And then we came back later and scanned it with uh, uh, once the drywall was in place. And we can use our opacity tool to go back into that space and turn down the outer layer and see what was underneath. So you could go back in after construction and find piping and stuff in the building or studs. Um, here are quick drop tools that can be customized. We just saw some tables and chairs right now or cones. And you can actually in this scan, uh, which was an old medical facility that was being torn down, but we, we scanned it and you can do layouts, scene layouts or uh, event layouts by placing tables and chairs or things that you want them. And then you can walk around them in first or third person views. We have markup tools like this where you can paint on the floors, or have fun painting on the walls here if you want to, but you could mark places you've been that some of the tools Marines wanted. And this scan, another interesting thing here is the uh, firefighters wanted the ability to have a heat map of radio signal strength. 
So we did testing in this house uh, with various transmitters and receivers to get, if you were in here as a firefighter, where would be a danger zone where you could not call for help if you were in trouble. And so we overlaid a heat map into the 3D space and you can walk through it in 3D saying where a danger zone for radio signal would be. Uh, we have measurement tools uh, that you can measure your scan and get the correct distance and see if things will fit. This one is another case where we were involved in a lawsuit. Unfortunately, a person died in an industrial accident here. Uh, at that time, we, uh, we did a drone scan of the a photogrammetry scan of this because we'd have a pro three and we at the earlier and uh, created the entire scene. And then we constructed objects and put it in and recreated the event. And this was used in court uh, to present the evidence. What I'm showing here is our drone tool though. We can fly around just like you have a drone and see a scene, uh, uh, explore any way you want to. Now, this is another case in a museum this is actually in the Vasa in Stockholm. They gave us the scan data of the interior since you can't go on to the Vasa uh, as, a, as a visitor to the museum. So we took the interior and built an exhibit inside of it, added cannons and put little markers. And that's part of what we're showing here are the markers that you can use and put information. And these markers are much like the matter tags. They can be linked to JPEGs, PDFs, videos, whatever you need them to be linked to when you click on them to explain kind of a walkthrough of an exhibit. Uh, and again, you're walking through at your pace, looking around or doing it in VR. Um, <clears throat> let's see what comes up next. Oh, this goes back here. But what we're showing here um, is the camera tool. So we can place multiple cameras in an environment and record for each each view as you're going through. So this court case here, we actually put a camera in the place of the security cam footage that was of the accident. And we were able to actually view our model through the actual physical camera and overlay and make sure everything aligned for the court presentation. Uh, and then that's recorded. And you, again, multiple. So it'd be a great uh, pre-vis or if you put, if you're doing a scene and you want to pre-vis where elements would be or stage actors, you could do the scan and set cameras up and say, if I had a camera here, here were what you would see. Or you can do it in the theater and get light sight lines for the audience as you're looking through uh, different spaces in the theater. Uh, so now we have our training aspect. So the first responders can come in and customize and create injuries uh, for different, uh, uh, if they come into a scene, it's been a mass casualty incident, they can actually customized or had them randomly generate in the space and say, I need 15 victims and I have a variety of injuries and it'll randomly paste them throughout the scene or they can put custom characters which they can uh, uh, recreate a scene if they're going back in and talk about what happened during this, this event. That what you see here, and this was in a hotel uh, locally, uh, the, uh, we have a scene here where the uh, EMTs, the emergency medical technicians come in and do triage on the patients that they find. And what they do is they mark them either green, yellow, red, or black, depending on the situation, uh, to try to see if they can help or move on at that time. So we created the scenario that they can go through and say what needs to be done in this situation. Um, and then this is the same thing happening, but in VR. Uh, so working in VR, it doesn't translate too well to a screen to show it in VR, but right now he's coming in doing a triage. And these people are talking to you, we have sounds that they're talking to you. Now, what we have here is our fire training tools. So once you have a scan, take your Matterport scan and we can come in and say, okay, if a fire started here, the carpet would burn quicker than the walls or vice versa, depending on what it would be. And you click on it and you say it'll burn at this rate and it'll give off this color smoke and have this color flames, which is a real uh, science to the firefighters that work on it. They when they come into a scene and the smoke they see tells them a lot of what they're going to be facing when they come into it. So you come in and say it'll burn like this, uh, it'll burn at this rate potentially, and then the smoke builds and they can fight it. Now this is actually fighting in VR uh, if through a simulated mask and the, the smoke will build and it'll include your vision just like it would in a real fire. And this can be done in any scenario. So you were talking earlier about the scenes you set for fire, fire responders to come into. This would be what they could do with that scan and say, if we had a fire start here, what would it be like in the space and how would how could you fight it? Um, 
let's see what we have next. This is a military training. So we're at a military military training facility and we set targets in it and we can put AI combatants into this space. So we can put patrol agents or stationary agents and then you come in and actually do a combat training building clear uh, with the space. And uh, uh, ob obviously, you know, you, you come, once you finish this, it actually gives you a, a scoring on how you, where your shots, where your placement was and it works in VR as well. Now, then we have some more fun use cases that we decided to create some uh, haunted houses. We can add elements, animated FBXs, again, sounds. Sorry, we don't have sounds on this. Uh, you come in here and see our, you know, weeping angel type setup here where uh, the, the quantum lock people come in when lights on and off. Uh, again, back to theater design. Once you light up a scene, but you can also just lay out everything you need in the space and then go and review it. Another fun use case is, again, all this was done in Matterport scans. It's easy to drop in. We had the uh, the elements now where we can kick off events and we actually build a small uh, Super Mario Brothers game that you can play. And again, all of it just you can do, anybody can do inside our site to set this up inside your space and create your little game. So playing with this is where we got the idea of why not turn this into uh, a zombie game and let people have fun experiencing uh, this uh, a game in their in their personal scans. Uh, so we did this and released this as just a fun one-off for people to start uh, scanning their space and releasing zombies into them, and uh, and then you can fight your way out of the zombie apocalypse that's coming here. So um, uh, you any space that you scan loaded in zombies will appear you've got to fight your way out uh and then we took this scan of the berengaria hotel uh in cyprus that someone had done in matter what matterport scan uh really pretty scan it's a really neat place to be in this abandoned hotel and of course we decided why not turn this into a, a zombie map uh which was a lot of fun so we did that um see or go in and of course the zombies will find me here in a minute they're ai zombies they're trying to look for you in the space and you've got they will cause damage and you have to find health it's just like a regular video game so we're releasing a game on steam called zombies irl which will work with any scan if they want to do that as well um so that's a general overview and a quick preview here of what's coming up next is merry matter pack we have a christmas game we're going to release here uh for the 12 days of christmas for uh, uh, letting you find presents and deliver them to, back to Santa where they were lost in your scans. So Matt, that's that's that, that, my... that's absolutely fantastic, Bill. I, <laughs> a lot of really interesting and and super fun stuff as well. Um, right, it's my presentation, and we're we're at sort of quarter two, so I'm going to try and be as quick as possible, and then we'll we'll move on to the discussion. Um, can everyone see my screen? So I can, yep. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, really, just going back over what Melissa said, you know, it's it's a, about um, capturing uh, and 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 digitizing, and then the link backwards. Um, so, there are absolutely loads of use cases, and I. If you want to explore more, I'd say go to the Matterport.com forward slash case studies. They've got so many on there, and that's just Matterport. There are so many other, you know, sensors and things that you can use to create digital twins. But it, I think if you want to start thinking about some of the use cases that, I mean, obviously we've explored loads here, but th there's even more um, there. Um, I won't go go through them. Um, so you can zoom in and out depending on what sort of digital twin use you're at, you know, whether it's a house and, and trying to, to, to think about uh, what to do in the zombie apocalypse or, um, you know, the real apocalypse that might be coming our way of climate change. Um, uh, and this is a website where you can sort of basically model what happens when you increase um, sea level. Um, this is effectively the same infographic that Melissa had, but um, it's it's from the RICS, and um, I wanted to give a shout out to um, Dr. Anil Sawney, who who did our last webinar, um, and he literally wrote a book on um, 
uh, and digital twins for for the RICS. So if you if you missed that webinar, we have it on our um, YouTube channel. So do do catch up on that. But the key point that Melissa got across far better than 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 uh, I need to is is that, that it's a two way process. You know, you use the the models to change and improve stuff in the real world. Um, and here is um, a little example of me using a different sensor, it's ground penetrating radar um, in the UK's most expensive building. Anyone got a guess? Bank of England. Um, yes, so we are we're mapping out some some heating pipes in the ceiling. I know it's a it's a, a pretty ordinary looking room, but we're using the AR functionality to um, to 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 map those GPR scans. Now I. I think you know with the, the sort of work that Bill's done, where you can bring up the opacity and you can um, you can see through walls because of what happened before. I think we're not far away from also being able to project things like scans into those digital twins, and and you can you can then do an as-built comparison where you you look back and you can see where the rebar is according to the scanner, and you can see where it, where it was put in, and then we can diagnose faults and, and see where they happen. You know, if the rebar is too far, too close to the surface and the, the concrete starts corroding, that sort of thing, we can see exactly along and, and, and we can also incorporate as-built surveys into that. So it's um, back to what Melissa was saying, it's, it's um, the, the golden thread. Um, and this is an excerpt from the Grenfell report, um, which shows really, why it's so serious that we, we we do want to document and create this golden thread for buildings and we can see exactly the processes that led to them and we can go back um, and, and try and do things better. Um, so that really is 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 the 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 end of my presentation um, and I'd like to move on to um, uh, have I done that right if I put put my screen back on um, Right, we should we should just be back with the panel now, um, and I have some some questions that that we can we can put to you. So, what are the key steps when creating a built environment? I guess is that a digital built environment or just the built environment in general? <laughs> um, just but, just to say, Matt, I'm afraid your screen. Well, for me, your screen is still showing. I'm not sure if it is still showing. Me. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, is it gone now? Ah, oh, there we go. Stop screen, sharing screen. It was all going so well until then, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> I was going to say I'm guessing, I'm guessing that, that question is directed at me. I'm guessing. I think so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, so, so the, the thing I didn't have time, obviously all of us had a bit of a whistle stop in, in each of our, we could probably each have been an hour or more uh, for each of our ones. Um, so I think that the, the key thing that underpins uh, a national digital twin um, would be an information management framework, um, because really everything that we're talking about, and I think all the visual show is, is data. So really, in the most basic thing, you don't actually, all, all this busy stuff we've just seen doesn't actually have to be all that busy stuff. It can just be the data about things. So, so you could actually define digital twins just saying the data of the, the physical asset. Um, and then if you want to be able to connect the data, then um, it's got to be interoperable. So um, and what we could do is we could have everybody um, do it their own way um, and then sort of have APIs and, and, and uh, you know, just be very, very expensive and make it very, very difficult, which is the way we do things at the moment. Um, so really, if we were going to do it, because we've got a blank sheet of paper and we're doing it from scratch. And as you've probably seen, the construction industry, I'd say, is, is very behind. Some of the amazing stuff you've seen going on in other sectors, I'd uh, say so we're not quite up to, to that speed. Um, would be to set up um, an information management framework and all that would really be is almost saying the rules of the game so that we can all play so you can still compete and play in the game but you've got the rules of the game and, and everybody knows how they're playing um, and so that, that would be the thing that would underpin it and then the second thing I would say is is that just to reinforce what I said before is that we're not talking about one giant simulation of the whole of the built environment in the UK. So that's not what it means. It doesn't mean that those things you've just seen presented, that you'd be able to do that across the whole of the UK for any asset, anywhere, at any time. It's not that. It is very much that everybody has their own digital twin in whatever form they've done it. But if it's within this information management framework, it's interoperable. And then you connect 
when required. So for example, with the buses, um, now we're able to know when a bus is arriving and you need that in real time. So you can now look up and see, okay, the next bus is coming in three minutes. And that's because of data that's coming from the bus itself. And then if it gets stuck in traffic, you've got real time update. <clears throat> so that's really important. If it's like maintenance of a pipe underneath the ground, it could be that they need that weekly or monthly or, you know, I don't know how often. So then it would be a waste if you were having real time continuous data um, coming from it. It would be a waste of the resource of a person sort of monitoring all this or the waste of the actual sort of technology. So, so we don't, it would only be connecting when it needs to be connected. So those are the two things I would say. One is that it's a federation of digital twins that connect when need to be. And the thing that's enabling that is an information management framework, which means that they can connect without having to have what are called translators in between them. Perfect. Um, next question is, will 3D scans eventually replace retail or help with building versions of them in the metaverse? I think that's probably Simon. <laughs> that's a good question. I had a feeling something like that would come up. Um, will it replace? Not anytime soon, I don't think. Um, I think there's a big drive to digitize everything and everything has to be online to be honest we've all been using digital quite you know for quite a while i mean just think about your mobile you know everything is pretty much done in your mobile that is a form of you know that is digital um will, will shops disappear i think i mean all we need to look at is stats you know uh, high street fit, um, football numbers have reduced um and they've reduced for a number of, of of different factors um is it because people don't like shopping no because at the same time, digital shopping figures have, have massively increased. I mean, the, the Black Friday and Cyber Monday figures, I don't think have come out yet. So that'll be interesting to see what that is in comparison to previous years. Um, I think digital twins just give a, an added uh, window um, for people to, or medium to access. You know, at the end of the day, we're all used to the Amazon Prime next day delivery type convenience of ordering, right? Um, what's to say maybe that, you know, you could, walk into a shop in like like one of the 3d models that we've shown there um and and do your shopping that way probably so i think it's definitely in, in the pipeline there are there are clients of mine that are looking at uh, are at that it's already in place in terms of on google street view um you know you can look for shops and you can you know you know street view a virtual tour of a store so yeah um there are other things in the google pipeline i can share that that they, that they will be coming out regarding that those you know and tags and things like that um so yeah, will it replace fully? No, not yet anyway, um, not anytime soon, but we are getting to digit, full, full on digitization. But hey, I, I do like to go out and talk to people as well, so I'm gonna kind of like say, no, not, not fully yet. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, a very broad question. I, I, you, 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 you covered very it pretty broad. well there. Very um, broad. <laughs> the next question is, how specifically is augmented reality used in construction? Um, and how is it used? Um, so uh, uh, has anyone had particular experience with augmented reality in construction? Simon, you're nodding. Um, yeah, so with um, I visited Microsoft Labs a while ago and they were doing these Microsoft um, uh, glasses, I think they're called. Um, and yeah, that, that was really cool stuff because, you know, you literally put on the glasses, you're looking at a huge piece of 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 um uh, uh, like of something uh, that's been constructed. If you can imagine these huge um, uh, blocks, for example, machinery uh, itself, you put it on the glass, and the glass straight away is using AR, and it's telling you what 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 it what it is, and you can walk around the the object, and you can even interact with it. With it. When I mean interact, you have these glasses, funny glasses on, and you're out there doing. But anyone else that's looking is thinking is just seeing you doing this, this, and that. But really, you're interacting itself so yes um bill you probably could probably expand on that but i know definitely in the construction sector is something that they are they are using it is actively being used at the moment ar very good on training elements as well doctors maybe maybe in, in the doctor world they use that they use ar and that's all when you have a digital representation of what you're looking at it's digitized and then you can interact with it um, bill, I mean, we, we we've used the hololens the microsoft hololens uh, the versions um uh, We've used them to wear and do scanning. We've we've done it with uh, soldiers doing this, looking around, wearing them to scan with it. But also, the construction example I gave, you can use that same level to stand in that space and turn down the wall and look with the hollow to see what's behind the space. Uh, mm -hmm. We've done some presentation in that area. Mm -hmm. 
and then just to combine our two worlds and um, they do do dress rehearsals so um in construction now um that they they can actually try it on site before they actually do it on site and they actually get everybody in a room and, and they do a dress rehearsal um so uh, i think that kind of brings our our two worlds together and for example national highways um when they were consulting with the public on some changes they created it in minecraft so that everyone the public could actually go in and actually really see this is actually what it will feel like and they use that for their consultation i think um the the the, the more we we get into it the the more um advantages we'll find with that sort of technology i mean even just for planning a construction site you know, if you if you use AR to see where all the houses will go, you probably won't put the skip on them. You know, the the week before you have to dig the foundations. You know, it's 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 things like that um, that that are just very simple visual rep representations that are easy to understand by 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 anyone. Um, right. I think we might be at the final question because we've got three minutes to go. So, hey, Bill, do we need to have any government-based certifications to operate for legal purposes? especially when contributing data for anything legal. Oh, for the court cases, I'm assuming that's what they mean. Is there so, anything yeah. that has to be? Oh, yeah. uh, for what we've done, no, it's, it's, uh, for our market at least, it's been just, uh, we're helping the attorneys tell their story. So we will do a scan, whatever they would need done at that time. Uh, if it's an interior space, arson investigation, things like that, do a Matterport scan with it. And then you just drop the elements in. Uh, we have not had to have any certifications to say this is actual. Uh, and you have to be prepared to testify that uh, and basically give the stats on I used a Matterport that's accurate at this distance and, and things yeah. like that. But that, that's it. Um, I had a brief question actually on data security. Do you, obviously the Matterport is processed in the cloud, but you can bring in, um, you have a BLK to go on your desk. Um, do you yes. do you process that locally? So that the because I'd imagine for the military you don't want to be sending stuff back and forth to the cloud. Uh, you can't for exactly that they have some of their own cloud services. We kind of bypass uh, some of that depending on what we use it. Uh, we, we've done we've done some cloud processing from the BOK to go and the Leica scanners, but on the uh, the, the Matter, Matterport is working with the military to have some of its own cloud type stuff. Uh, also, the things that are more sensitive, we will do local processing on. Not with the Matterport yet; that's not available. But for uh, the the BLK, the lidar stuff like that, you can actually do local conversion to mesh. And and I would just add that um, it's the other stuff. On one of my slides, I said it's not just about digital twins, and it's the other stuff is just as important. And sometimes the digital stuff is the easy bit. And it's the things like the legal agreements around data sharing on Credo. I think it took about five months uh, and, and that's nothing to do with the, the digital twin or, or, or the digitalization. Yeah, and it's the same with um, mapping out our utilities network and, and, and sharing where everything is underground. You know, it's obviously a great win for us all if we can share that. Um, but it, I think it's, it's, I, I, it's on, on that. the agreements. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I was like, no, sorry. No, I was just going to say, like, I think the whole digital twin term is definitely being thrown around everywhere, different sectors and things like that. But when you think about it, electric cars, if you get a Tesla with the autopilots, uh, or if you have a Mercedes, for example, or some of the cars, when you open up your, when you do a rear view going to, you know, reverse, you get a camera, right? You sometimes get an aerial view, uh, which would, for those Matterport users, they call it, oh, it's, a, it's just like an aerial uh, dollhouse looking thing. It's all kind of, the tech is there already, and it's already right in front of us when you think about it. And when you think of the, where all the EV or the electric cars and the autopilot systems are going, it's a constant LiDAR system just mapping out as you're driving along objects and, 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 mm -hmm. and what it sees. I mean, even now, even if you don't have a, an electric car, your car will tell you on your speedometer 30 miles an hour. But you ever notice that when, as soon as you see the car passes a 30 mile per hour sign, it's read that and it's telling you on, on your dashboard, you know, the tech is there and that is digitization. And it's in, in a way, in, it wouldn't surprise me if all of this is kind of like, at some stage we'll create an overall national digital twin of a city as, as we go along, you know? So the, the tech is exciting. I mean, the tech is there and um, Bill, I mean, I, I and Melissa, I, I want to have chats with you guys afterwards for sure. <laughs> like I said, it's like, wow. hours, this is like one hour for three of us. Matt, what are you doing to us, mate? I'm yeah, like, I, I think, I think, I think on, on that 
on that note, that's the that is the hour, um, and and a good note to end it on. The tech is there; it's what you do with it that counts. Um, and so I'd I'd like to thank all of our speakers, um, Melissa Zanoko, Simon Sadek, and and Bill Gregory. You can find out more um, through their websites, which will be in the link afterwards. Um, and um, I just say we, we've been doing these things monthly. Um, we won't be doing one in December. We will be doing another one on reality capture and laser scanning in January. And there will be a Massport giveaway for all those that attend. So do make sure you sign up. But um, with that, I'd like to thank all my speakers and thank you for attending. And um, hopefully see you at the next one in January. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Take care, everyone. Ciao.